Our model of the atom has changed quite a bit over time. We're going to look at how the atom actually has undergone its current um, modifications the way that we see it now. But it all started with the electron, and, and it was the first of the subatomic particles that had been discovered. Benjamin Franklin, running his experiments with lightnings and kites, actually was trying to prove that electricity was the same thing, static electricity was the same thing the lightning bolts were. There's an experiment you can do with a simple balloon. You can blow the balloon up, tear up a sheet of paper into very, very fine particles, rub the balloon on your head, and it'll actually pick up the uh, particles. Uh, you do the same thing, very similar demonstration, when you scuff your feet along the floor and shock the back of your little brother's ear. Uh, that static electrical charge is just a dissipation of electrons from a charged body. So, where is the electron and what is it? These kind of experiments really stumped scientists for many years. It was the invention of a cathode ray tube that kind of uh, identified a little bit more about what they are. And a cathode ray tube is nothing more than a glass tube that's been evacuated and it has a zinc sulfide screen inside it. Now you say, well, why zinc sulfide? Well, if you've ever seen these little guys, and I just put it up above and charged them for just a second. I don't, I don't imagine you can see the glow. Yeah, you can't see the glow very well with them like that. But these shining stars are uh, actually they are plastic with zinc sulfide inside them. So when you put them against the light, they will shine for a little while as the zinc sulfide gives off the energy. Well, that's what we have on the inside of this cathode ray tube. There's a zinc sulfide screen. And the cathode, the source of electrons, on the one side from a battery, the anode from the other side, uh, you can think of it as the vacuum cleaner that's going to pull those electrons across. They found that as they charged it with an electrical charge going across there, a beam would be uh, seen across this zinc sulfide screen as a very thin line. Now, if you take a magnet or an electrical field, above it and below it, you can actually cause that cathode ray to bend away from or towards the magnetic field, depending on which direction the magnet is oriented. Well, you might remember the practical application to these CRT tubes was Philo T. Farnsworth's invention of the television. The television caused that to fluctuate fast enough. If it cycles more than 60 times a second, your eye thinks that it appears as a series of images that, that are in motion. So uh, the cathode ray tube was the first real discovery of a subatomic particle. It was J.J. Thompson that come along and said, well, wait a minute. If you've got a subatomic particle, where is it in the atom? You'll remember John Dalton's theory that the atom was just simply a round sphere uh, that was indivisible, as Democritus had, uh, had presented. But yet Thompson says if you've got electrons that are flowing, therefore they have to be someplace in the atom. And he proposed what we call the plum pudding model. The plum pudding model basically says that you've got this matrix of material that has a positive charge and you have electrons that have negative charges inside that plum pudding. Now, as we flow electrical currents, we take the plums from one loaf of bread to the next sort of thing. But he was also able to use things like the Crookes tube, etc., or the uh, cathode ray tube, another name is a Crookes tube, uh, to calculate the charge to mass ratio on electrons. He couldn't calculate their charge, he couldn't calculate their mass, but he could calculate the charge to mass ratio. The actual calculation of the charge on an electron was left to another man, Robert Milliken, who is the next in the series of our people that we're going to look at. Robert, Robert Milliken uh, came up with an idea. He says, you know, I take my wife's atomizer, which is a perfume bottle, sprays very fine droplets, and he recognized that they all fell at about the same rate in a gravitational field. So he designed basically a coffee can with a, a plate in it that he charged with electrical current. He charged the top one positively and the bottom one negatively. He drilled a hole in the center of it, and as he sprayed very fine oil droplets through his wife's atomizer, I'm sure it made her happy, ended up 
falling at a very constant rate. So he put a microscope piece so that he could see them. He put a measurement device in there, which is not shown in this diagram. And he charged the plates positively and negative. And he found that as he adjusted the charge on the upper plate, he could get some of them to stop. Some of them would continue to fall. And as he varied the electrical current, some of them would, would be pulled back up as well. So he started calculating the various electrical charges that would cause this. And as he did so, he found that they were all whole number multiples of each other. Now that's kind of critical because think about what he had actually done. As he'd put this ionizing radiation on each of the droplets, some of the droplets all falling at the same rate, but as he varied them, we figure he may have put one electron on one, two electrons on another, three electrons on, on another. And as he increased the voltage, he could get them to fall or rise at different rates based on the number of electrons that were present. So from that, he was able to actually calculate the charge on the electron. And if you know the charge on the electron, you can cal calculate the mass from the previous experiment. So we find that the mass of an electron to be 9.1 1, times 10 to the minus 28 grams, which is extremely small, or 1 1840th part the mass of a proton. So those numbers, this one is probably more important than this one at this point. Next experiment that comes along says, okay, now, well, if we've got electrons, we now know their charge and their mass, let's discover something about this plum pudding model. Now, you have to see this plum pudding model as, well, if it's basically raisin loaf with a, uh, a bunch of electrons stuffed through it, then it ought to be kind of easily to penetrate. So Ernest Rutherford designs an experiment called the gold foil experiment. He took another zinc sulfide screen, wrapped it around the outside of a uh, piece of gold foil. He took a lead block and drilled a hole in it and put some uh, material like uranium that would produce alpha particles, and he would shoot that directly at the gold foil. Now, the theory was, if the atom was a mushy raisin loaf, all the alpha particles would just go screaming straight through that mushy loaf of an atom. It makes complete sense. The alpha particle was known at the time to be the most massive material on the Earth. And so as he aimed those through there, most of the alpha particles went through unobstructed. But every once in a while, he would catch a flash at weird angles. And even some of them, not only were at weird angles, were being reflected back. Now, that causes a real problem for a physicist that's throwing the most dense matter on the Earth at something that's supposed to be a mushy little uh, raisin loaf. And what he determined was that there must be something in the center of that atom, in the gold atoms, that was more dense than the alpha particle. And he proposed a new model known as the nuclear model. Get my right sheet of paper here. The nuclear model, where the mass of an atom is located in the center with all those electrons just located around the outside. Now, this is the current model that most people are familiar with, uh, the Bohr model of the atom. Uh, there are a few major problems with this, like circular paths and a few other things, and the ratio of size. But it's a good logical approach to that. If we're deflecting those alpha particles in odd directions, that center must be more dense than the alpha particle. Well, now we understand an alpha particle is nothing but a nucleus of a helium atom. So it's similar to that, except smaller, and it doesn't have any electrons. So by calculation of the volume of the atom to the volume of the nucleus, based on how many um, alpha particles went straight through versus how many were deflected, we find that the mass is located in the center with most of the atom being empty space. The vast majority of that. I've heard uh, analysis all the way from if you put the uh, uh, proton up to the size of a pea, put it in the center of a football field, uh, the nearest electrons flying around up in the cheap seats. Another model says that if we pull the nucleus up to the size of a golf ball, the electrons the size of a fly, which is pretty accurate relative to that. But the nearest fly to that golf ball would be about a mile away. So 
no matter how you look at it, the atom is basically empty space with a very dense nucleus at its center with the electrons around the outside. Now, I tell my students that basically we're all illusions. If, that, if we're that much of us as empty space, uh, well, why, <laughs> why can't we see right through us? Well, we sort of, if you look at your hands and you push your hands together, if we were that much empty space, why don't they just superimpose over the top, go right through each other? Well, that's the purpose of the electrons. Negatively charged atoms re repel other negatively charged atoms with their electron clouds, and it, that force is great enough to not allow your hands to push completely together. Later on, the neutron was discovered by James Chadwick in 1935, and that altered the complete approach of the atom. Now we know about electrons. We had discovered the nucleus. We isolated neutrons. The remaining particle then would be the proton in the center, and we have our completed model of the atom. Now in summary then, this is what we look at with the atomic model. It's made of those three particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. The electron is the smallest. Its actual mass, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 28 grams. Its relative mass is 1 1840th part of a proton. Its relative charge is 1 negative, which is the same charge but opposite of a proton. Its symbol is E negative, and it's located in the area around the nucleus. The proton, with a P plus indication, is found in the nucleus with a relative mass of or relative electrical charge of plus one, the opposite of an electron. Its mass is one, the same as a neutron. Its actual mass, 1.673 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. Very, very small. The neutron, N0, also found in the nucleus. It has no electrical charge at all. It affects nothing but the mass of an atom. And it has a relative mass of one, and it's about the same mass as a proton. But it is unique to note this. This comes in later on. You'll notice that out to four significant figures, they're about the same mass. But that about is significant later on because the neutron is about the mass of an electron heavier than a proton. When we start going through beta decay in radioactive decay, we find that neutrons give off electrons and become protons. So a neutron is nothing more than a proton with an electron swedged on the side of it. That is really for later on, but it's interesting. Final thoughts on the electron location? We now think that it resides in electron orbitals or in a cloud around the outside of the nucleus. We'll discuss that later in great detail and as we look at electron configurations. But you now have a little bit of the history and some contribution of the people that came up with our modern concept of the atom.